Hello, everyone, and welcome to worship. Um, I hope this is our last Sunday that's just going to be virtual. And by January the 30th, I think is the date, um, we'll be back um, in person. We'll still be virtual as well for those of you that um, are going to stay home. Um, because I think the, num the COVID numbers are going down a bit. We'll see what happens this week. Um, but hopefully... A um, couple of announcements. I've said this before. We're going to do a diaper shower at Norrisville for Lexi Beatty. She's having a little boy mid-February. So um, if you could drop off some diapers at church or the hall or, um, or let me know and we can work out dropping them off at my house or I'll pick them up at your house um, so that we can uh, stock her up um, for this new baby, this new bundle of joy. Our shelter night is in February and where we're going to do pizza. That's still the plan. Um, for that night. However, I heard this week that um, all the shelter guests have been moved to a motel again um, because of a staffing issue, um, which might mean uh, lots of, lots of po folks there have COVID. So, um, so I don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks, but we'll uh, keep you informed as we get closer. Um, Hope is planning their annual um, uh, pasta dinner at New Freedom Restaurant on Monday, February the 28th. Um, it's going to be $12.99 a person. Um, time, uh, it starts at 4, I believe, and goes until 9. And um, carryout will be available. Um, so if you'd like to go in and uh, support Hope, all of that money goes to Hope. Um, all the food is donated by the owners of the restaurant. Um, the servers donate their time and efforts. Um, so uh, um, it's always a, a good fundraiser for Hope. Um, I am. Um, I couldn't decide this week on what to use as a call to worship, so I actually have two, um, and uh, they both talk about prayer, which is going to be our theme for today. Prayer is uniting our will with the will of God. It is not an attempt to get God to do our will. It is desiring to do what delights God. It is discovering that what pleases God will ultimately bring us joy as well. It is following in God's footsteps, even when God leads where we fear to go. That's by James Mulholland from a book called Praying Like Jesus. And then I have a poem called Tame Prayers by Kent Ira Groff. He says, most prayers are too tame, pitying self while others act, sitting by the pool and feeling lame. Prayer is an explosion of the heart. Crazy Noah building the ark. Abraham bartering with the Lord. Wild-eyed Isaac at the altar. Jacob wrestling in the night. Deborah leading a victory march. Elijah calling down the rain. Job talking, to, uh, talking God to court. Taking God to court. Ruth entreating, do not part. Widows knocking on judges' doors. Outcasts touching Jesus' hem. And a Canaanite mother claiming crumbs, Mary anointing the guru's feet. Jesus crying, why, my God, my God. Startled women at the empty tomb, Paul in prison singing hymns, John in exile dreaming dreams. Prayer is action and retreat, wherever God and humans meet. Let us pray. Oh God, may my love be genuine. May I let go what is evil in me and open myself to what is good. By your spirit in me, may I truly love others, not just to tolerate them, but to honor them. Give me your zeal, your energy, the true desire to serve you. Give me the faith to rejoice with hope, to be patient in suffering, and to persevere in prayer. Help me take the opportunities I will have today to contribute to the needs of those around me, to extend hospitality to strangers, to bless those who bless me, to bless and not to curse them. I am mindful of those who rejoice and I rejoice with them. I am mindful of those who weep and I weep with them. May I be present for them today. Give me your grace to live this day in harmony with others. I do not need to pretend that I am wiser than I am. Help me not to be haughty, but to know that the lowly are my peers. Give me grace to not repay evil for evil, but to focus on what is good for the sake of all. Give me grace to live peaceably with all. Give me your grace to feed the hungry even if they oppose me, 
to drink, to give drink to the thirsty, even if I do not like them. I pray that I will not be overcome by evil, but that I may overcome evil with good by the grace of your love with me. Amen. Our gospel lesson today is one of those passages about Jesus and prayer. It's from Luke in the, the 11th chapter, the first 13 verses, where it says Jesus was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And Jesus then said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me, the door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish, or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Here ends the reading of our scripture for today. May God add understanding to all of us. Um, I was looking at a couple of books to bring um, about praying. And um, this, um, I always say this, is one of my favorites. Um, it's by Douglas Wood, and he's the guy that wrote Old Turtle and a whole bunch of other neat things. And this one's called Granddad's Prayers of the Earth. And uh, not only are the words beautiful, so are the pictures. I know you won't be able to get those too much for today, but um, it's a great book to have. I use it at funerals sometimes, but it's good for, um, good for us as we talk about prayer as well. When I was little, my granddad was my best friend. Being with him always made the world seem just right. Granddad and I liked to go for walks in the woods together, and we didn't go very far or very fast or very straight. While we walked, I would ask him questions about things I wasn't sure of. Why is it, Granddad? I would ask, and what if, and does it ever? One day I asked my Granddad about prayers. For a long time, Granddad was quiet. He didn't say anything until we came to the tallest trees in the forest. And then he answered with a question. Did you know, boy, he whispered, that trees pray? I listened closely but I couldn't hear them. See how they reach for the sky, he said. They reach and reach for clouds and sun and moon and stars. And what else is reaching for heaven but a prayer? I thought about the trees and kept listening for them. And while I thought, I sat down on an old mossy rock. Rocks pray too, said Granddad. Pebbles and boulders and old weathered hills, they are still and silent. And those are two important ways to pray. I thought hard about the rocks. I picked up a pebble and stuck it in my pocket. We walked a little farther and came to a small stream. The water splashed and sparkled and tiny fish hovered in the shadows. Do streams pray too, Granddad, I asked. Streams pray too, he answered, and lakes and rivers and waters of all kinds. Sometimes they pray silently like the rocks. They lie still and calm, reflecting clouds or birds or sunsets or the first evening star. Sometimes they pray with movement, flowing across the face of the earth, giving themselves to the ocean, giving themselves to the sky, and beginning their journey all over again. Sometimes waters pray with laughter, chuckling to their friends the rocks, and sometimes they pray by dancing, leaping into the air and falling back again. These are all ways to pray, said Granddad, but there are more. 
The tall grass prays as it waves its arms beneath the sky, and the flowers pray as they breathe their sweetness into the air. The wind prays as it whispers and moans and sighs. It is saying a prayer and singing a hymn at the same time. A bird prays when it sings the first song of the morning, and it prays at that silent moment just before it sings. And the robin's last song at sundown is an evening prayer. All the beings of the world pray, said my granddad, as they slip through the forest or sparkle in the water, as they climb mountainsides or soar into the clouds or burrow into the earth. Each living thing gives its life to the beauty of all life, and that gift is prayer. Then we were quiet, my granddad and I. He was watching something far away, and, was thinking, and I was thinking about all he had said about rocks and trees and grass and birds and flowers. Finally, I asked him to tell me about the prayers of people. Granddad smiled and ruffled my hair. People pray some of the most wonderful prayers of all, he said. Bending down to smell a flower can be a prayer, said my granddad. Quietly watching the sunrise, feeling the slow turning of the earth and saying hello to a new day is one of the oldest prayers. Standing in a snowy woods on a winter day and watching your breath become part of the breath of the world is a way to pray. Making music or painting a picture can be a prayer. Holding hands around the table with family and friends, remembering all that holds us together and giving thanks is one of the greatest prayers. Sometimes, said Granddad, people pray when they are sad or sick or lonely or have a problem too big to carry by themselves. They may say words they have learned from their fathers or mothers or granddads or great-grandmothers, but often they must find their own words. The important thing to remember is that the words will always be right if they are real and true and come from the heart. We had walked far enough, and Granddad said it was time to go back, but I had one last question. Are our prayers answered, Granddad, I asked. Granddad smiled. Most prayers are not really questions, he said, and if we listen very closely, a prayer is often its own answer. Like the trees and winds and waters, we pray because we are here, not to change the world, but to change ourselves. Because it is when we change ourselves that the world is changed. My granddad and I went for many walks after that one, and I often listened for the prayers of the earth, but was never sure I heard them. And then one day, my granddad was gone. And no matter how hard I prayed, he didn't come back. He couldn't come back. I prayed and prayed and prayed until I couldn't pray anymore. And so I didn't, not for a long time. And the world seemed dark and lonely without my granddad in it. Until one day, I went for a walk, and I found a big rock under some tall trees, and I sat down on it. Overhead, the branches swayed, and a breeze whispered in the leaves. I heard a stream flowing nearby, and a robin singing from a honeysuckle bush. And I heard something else, too, something in the sounds of breezes and birds and water. I heard prayers. The earth was praying, just like my granddad said. So I joined in. Thank you, I prayed, for tall trees and sweet flowers, for, sing for still rocks and singing birds, and especially for my granddad. And as I prayed, something changed, and my granddad seemed somehow near. And for the first time in a long time, the world seemed just right. The end. I think that's a neat, neat book. Have you ever thought about what shapes you? Oh, let me do the Lord's Prayer now. I almost forgot. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I'll start. Have you ever thought about what shapes you? What is it that shapes who we are and why we do the things that we do? Certainly, this pandemic has shaped us, whether we like it or not, for these last 98 weeks of our lives. 
Most of us are more careful about shaking hands or hugging people or being within six feet of them. We're more careful about where we go and who we come into contact with. We wear masks and get vaccinated. Perhaps um, we do the thing to, uh, and we uh, do things to boost our immune system and avoid germs too. Media also shapes us for sure. Advertiser shapes us into good consumers and tells us how stunning we would look if we just bought a certain product or how much fun we would have if we partake in the latest snake oil. Life experience shapes us too. If we're riding in the passenger seat of the car and see a hazard up ahead, many of us with any driving experience automatically push our foot to the floor in hopes of slowing the car down even without a brake pedal under our feet. Often when my girls were teenagers, I would get the eye roll extraordinaire when I would tell them they couldn't do such and such because I had buried someone who had tried that. And last week I told you how I was starting off on a sermon series for confirmands and members and, and that between now and Pentecost coming in June, we would be talking about what it means to be members of this church and of the United Methodist Church. We're going to be learning things like what sacraments are all about, what grace is, who God is, what the Bible means for us today, um, and some history of the United Methodist Church as well. Last week we talked about baptism um, and our own um, baptisms, and for the next five weeks or so we're going to talk about the five promises that we make when we join church. We're going to talk about our prayers, our presence here in church, our gifts and, who we, um, and, and how we give to God, our service um, to our church and our community and the world, and our witness, how we tell others about our faith. If you are already a member here or somewhere else if you're watching from home, I hope this series helps you to recommit to the church. Um, I'm thinking that we've all become a little bit lax and standoffish and out of the habits that we need for a strong faith. Um, um, because the, the church has been so different through this pandemic. Um, and it's made our lives different. It has shaped us in a different way. So today we're going to talk about how prayer shapes us. About how opening ourselves to God um, by praising and confessing and asking and sometimes listening, we are changed. I'm not sure if prayer is first on this list of promises that we make as we join the church because it was considered the most important promise, um, but maybe that's the case. Probably the most important action of any Christian is prayer. You cannot be a disciple without a prayer life. You cannot work to transform yourself or the church or our world if you don't pray. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you have to be a good prayer. I'm not saying you have to spend hours every day on your knees in prayer. I'm not saying you have to come up with eloquent words to pray. You don't even have to use words to pray, but you have to find a way to pray. Why? Why do you have to pray? Doesn't God already know what we want and what we think? Well, yes. But we don't pray for God's sake. We pray for our own sake and for the sake of our relationship with God. Let's just say you got married, but you never spoke to your spouse. I know Tom prays for that at our house. But, but how would you share your hopes and your fears and your dreams if you didn't communicate? How would your relationship be, especially after many years of not sharing and discussing and sometimes arguing? I would guess that your relationship wouldn't be very good, maybe even non-existent. So prayer gives us a relationship with God and sustains that relationship. It's an act of intimacy with God. But also if we don't pray, that says something about us. It says that we're putting ourselves in God's place. If we don't pray, it's like claiming that we already have all the solutions, all the answers inside of us. To not pray is to claim that we can meet all of our needs by ourselves. We don't need any help. We don't need anybody else. So we need to pray because it's not just about us. 
Our gospel lesson today is Luke's account of Jesus teaching his disciples the Lord's Prayer. We don't know why the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Maybe they were seeking a more God-shaped life. Or maybe they were asking Jesus for help understanding God. Is God some remote being, far and aloof, who doesn't really care about us mere mortals? Is God a tough, judgmental parent who needs things done the right way in order to earn a response? Or is God a loving parent who cares for the disciples like a parent is devoted to their children? Maybe in asking Jesus how to pray, the disciples are also asking Jesus to tell them who God is and to tell them who they are in relationship to God. So let me remind you of the setting here. The culture of the disciples was so much different than our culture today. They had this sense of hierarchy. They lived in a culture where everyone was not equal at all. People with power and money and things were considered more honorable and more prestigious than those who didn't have those things. But Jesus was undoing all those norms. And he was undoing all the honor and shame stuff that was such a, 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 a pull in their culture. And teaching, he was teaching that everyone mattered to God. So when the disciples asked him about prayer, deep down they were also asking him about what matters to God. So to answer them, Jesus told a little parable. Somebody drops um, by your house in the middle of the night. Your cupboard's bare and the wine jug is empty. Walmart was not 24 hours back then, you know. So you go to your neighbors and you bang on the door, even though it's the middle of the night, and, and you insist that they come help you. And while your neighbor is your friend, the rule of the day did not require that they get out of bed and put together a bag of food for you. But the rules of honor and shame do require that your neighbor gets out of bed to give you food and drink to give to your guests so that you do not lose honor. Jesus is telling his disciples that God is not put off by this senseless knocking. God is not put off by their relentless prayers. God is the friend whose door they pound on in the middle of the night. God honors us and meets our needs. And then Jesus says some of the most confounding words to be found in the Bible. Ask and you shall receive. Confounding because that's not the way it works. We have all had prayers go unanswered. We pray and pray and hear nothing in response. I know I had everyone praying for the baby Shannon carried through November, and we lost her anyway. Did we not pray the right way? Did we use the wrong words or too many words or not enough words? Did God sense some sort of doubt in our prayers? I know we've all wondered about unanswered prayer. We've all been angered about unanswered prayer. Maybe we've all been shaped, too, by unanswered prayer. But just because God is silent does not mean God is absent. We may not get the answers we want when we want them. My friend Nancy pointed out this week, there's a song in our hymnal called Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart that has the line, Teach Me the Patience of Unanswered Prayer. It was written back in the 1800s. Certainly unanswered prayer has gone on the back a lot before that, too. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be answered. But haven't we been praying for for God's will for centuries? Uh, God's will is still not done here on earth. Don't people go hungry? We pray for God to give us bread each day. We pray for forgiveness and still hold grudges too, but but we keep saying these things, don't we? And saying them helps to shape us. Prayer changes us. I believe that there's a deep mystery in this thing we call prayer. You might say that prayer is a conversation with God. Some might say that prayer is communion with God. However you think about it, it's a relationship between two parties who are not equal. There's the likes of you and me, who are frail and mortal and mixed up in an odd mix of good and bad. And then there's God, all-powerful, all-knowing, forgiving creator of all that is. 
rationally speaking, it makes no sense that God Almighty would care for us feeble human beings. It's kind of like saying that the sun cares about a dandelion. That dandelion can't live without the sun, but the sun has no need of that pesky little weed. And yet the dandelion grows and turns to the warmth of that light and blooms. Jesus prays and teaches his disciples to pray because whatever prayer is, it's more than a conversation between unequal parties. The deepest human emotions are at play in prayer, as is all the trust and hope we put into God. A desire, usually for a better outcome, is expressed. Faith is present, whether it be desperate or solid. Maybe more important in the act of prayer than what we ask is the act of prayer itself. That desire to have God enter our lives and our world and make them more godlike. Maybe in the scheme of things, God's answering our prayers is not as important as our asking for them. Lutheran pastor Nadia Boltz Weber says this about prayer. It's a long quote, so give me a, a, a chance here. She says, I used to think uh, that prayer was like a quarter that you'd put into God's vending machine so God would release the gumball you wanted. Like prayer is handing God some kind of wish list of everything you want. And if you're a good little girl or boy, then Santa, I mean God, will make sure you get the presents. She says, but now in my life, I mostly pray for family and friends. And I pray for the pain and violence of this world. And I pray not to be a jerk. I can't say I'm good at it, but I do what I can. Even though I'm not always sure how prayer works, I know that when someone says they're praying for me, it matters in some way. So I've started to think that our prayer is less how we get what we want and more how God gets what God wants. Because prayer isn't an individual sport. If anything, it's more of a relay race. It's what we do for each other and what we do for the world. When we pray... We hold ourselves and our loved ones and the world up to God, and then we pass it off for the next person to do the same. Nadia goes on to say, when we pray on another's behalf, we become connected to that person through God. And we become connected to God through that person because maybe these silken threads of prayer which connect us to God and to one another and even to our enemies are how God is stitching our broken humanity back together. Hmm. The very first word of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples confirms this. He said, our Father. Not my Father. Not give me my daily bread. Not forgive my sins. Not lead me not into temptation. <sighs> now this is a plural prayer. When Jesus prays it, he's praying with us, with all of us. It's not about us, and it should help us to realize that we are not in control of our world or even fully in charge of ourselves. A preacher named Beth Neal said that for a while, whenever she prayed the Lord's Prayer, she imagined that someone, was having, someone she was having a hard time with was saying it with her. And that helped her start thinking about compassion and forgiveness. Maybe we should try that. Years ago, a friend of mine said her church had the tradition of saying the Lord's Prayer when everyone would gather in a circle around the sanctuary. They would get up from their pews and move to the outskirts of the church. Um, and as they said the Lord's Prayer, they didn't look down at their feet to say this prayer. They looked at each other. They looked each other in the eye. She said it was a powerful act to look somebody in the eye as you say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It became more of a promise, in fact, that they would forgive, that the act of praying and focusing on others symbolized their commitment to do just that. That act of prayer and looking at the fellow prayers shaped them. Writer Rachel Held Evans has written a lot about her journey of faith. She passed away a couple of years ago, um, but writes ex wrote excellent work. She said she was glad that she grew up in a church that emphasized the importance of a personal relationship with God from an early stage. She grew up in evangelical churches, and she was encouraged to pray openly about whatever was on her mind. She called it shooting the breeze with Jesus. 
And she talked to God about whatever came to mind, her teenage friends, her hopes, her questions, her fears, her crushes. Jesus heard it all. But she said her prayer life became much richer, much deeper, when she discovered structured prayer and incorporated it into her daily devotional practices. By structured prayer, she meant prayers drawn from Scripture or written by other people or those that were passed down through the ages. She said there were many times when she didn't feel like praying or couldn't find the words herself, but she has brothers and sisters that provide the prayers for her and for us. I was reminded of a conversation that I had with a former member who once told me that he had grown up in a family for whom religion was just rote. Um, you did it because it was expected, not because anyone really felt connected to God. And he said every night they sat down at the dinner table and they said grace before dinner. And they said, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. He said they said the words, but nobody ever really prayed it. They were just words. And I was struck because that's the prayer that we use at our house. It's the prayer that Tom grew up with, and we love it. My family didn't pray before meals, so I loved that his family always did and always said these same words. We continued that tradition when our girls came around and have continued to say, bless us, O Lord, before meals, even now, although sometimes every once in a while we ask Weston to say the prayer, and he sings A, B, C, D, E, F, G, thank you, God, for feeding me. Just a reminder that not every prayer works for everybody. Emmy Kegler, a young the theologian, points out that we each have to find the kind of prayer that's helpful to us. She says praying in tongues, for example, might be of deep consolation within a, a Pentecostal service, but it could be disruptive and isolating within less spontaneous worship services like in an Episcopal church, or even terrifying for a person experiencing, experiencing it at home. She says the rhythm and repetition of the Catholic rosary might be recentering for one faithful Catholic, but sleep-inducing for another person who's just as faithful. The serenity prayer, with its challenge to accept the things I cannot change, can be restorative for those struggling from addiction or devastating to those suffering from abuse they cannot escape. Sometimes prayer is a space in which we are free to weep. For God knows the words we can't bear to say. Sometimes prayer is a sending, a commissioning, a gift of courage. Sometimes it's a terrifying opportunity to open ourselves to the God of the universe who knows every hair on our heads. Kegler writes out of a place where she struggles with mental illness, with depression. And she wisely articulates that often mental illness lies trying to trick that person into believing that they are all alone and isolated and no one is near or cares for them. But prayer gives her a renewed sense of connection to God and also to those who are around her in need. Prayer reminds her that others have hurts too. And she needs to reach out in service and love and not dwell on herself. Theologian Robert Foster says that prayer is no little habit tacked onto the periphery of our lives. It is our lives. So this week, your homework is to talk about the questions that um, are in the, the announcement part of the bulletin, if you have that. And if you don't have it, I'm going to tell you what the questions are now. How often, And ask yourself this Preferably ask yourself in the context of a family situation with your spouse or your kids or whoever might be around and have it as a family conversation. How often do you pray? Why do you pray? Are your prayers answered? How, how do you like to pray? What kind of prayer works best for you? What are you really praying for? And how does prayer change you? So talk about your prayer life with your family. Think about what you need to do in your prayer life to maybe take it up a notch. Don't be afraid if your prayer time is not like others around you. We all do it differently. One of my girls prays in the car on her way to work each day. That's her time. I like walking while I pray. Um, and then when I'm inside, I have um, these post-it notes all over my office. Tom complains about them constantly. Um, but they're all people or, or, or circumstances that I want to pray for and I don't want to forget. 
Sometimes singing Amazing Grace or some other hymn is a prayer. Pray for yourself. Pray for others. Pray for our church. Pray for this pandemic to end. Pray for our frontline workers. Pray for all who grieve. Make a list um, or, or don't do any of that and just be silent because silence can be a prayer too, as our book said this morning. Or just say, Lord, teach me to pray because he will and it will indeed shape you. Let us pray. Oh Lord, teach us all to be better prayers. Use our prayers to connect us with others and open us to your answers. In the name of the one who taught us to pray, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the time where in worship we would share some prayer concerns and joys and thanksgivings and ways we've seen God at work this, this week. Um, and um, so certainly email me some of those things. Um, it's been great to see more of our um, good news being shared. Um, happy birthday to Ruth Ann. Um, I hope she had a great day this week. Um, some of the prayer concerns that I thought about sharing for, for our uh, purposes now, um, uh, Maggie Parker has a friend named Jean who was just diagnosed with lung cancer. It was quite a shock um, for her, so um, keep Jean in your prayers. Um, Rhonda, Wanda Robal um, started up chemo again this week, um, so keep her in your prayers. Um, Evelyn Baker um, is 100 years old. She's Polly Mitchell's friend, um, and she entered hospice this week. So um, she's nearing the end of her life. Um, uh, she and her family have often come to a lot of our um, uh, functions. Um, she, uh, Polly often brought her to our senior lunches at Norrisville. And there's a family in the Norrisville community that lost a son, a uh, 20-year-old son, uh, um, to drugs, and uh, they need our prayers um, it was just a devastating loss for all of them and all who knew him. So let us pray. Oh, holy God, no matter who we are or what we've done, you welcome us home with open arms. We don't have to say the right words when we have, or, and sometimes we have no words at all. And you love us no matter what, and you shower us with love and grace. Today we pray for our brothers and sisters in Tonga where homes and lives have been, have been decimated by tsunami waves triggered by a volcanic eruption. These folks are cut off because their whole electrical grid is down. We pray for our siblings in the Ukraine as troops from Russia approach their borders and anxiety around the world increases. We pray for countries everywhere where lives have been turned upside down by political and ec economic upheaval especially in Kazakhstan and, and Haiti. We pray for those held hostage at a, kin at a synagogue earlier this week and pray your love and peace as they heal from that ordeal. We pray that you stop the spread of lies and prejudices that fuel bigotry and anti-Semitism and all kinds of hatred in the world and within ourselves. Of course, we pray for the people struggling everywhere with COVID, for those working the front lines, for those grieving the loss of loved ones, for those battling long haul effects. And we pray for families battling addiction, for those in pain, for those who struggle. We don't even have to say their names because you already know. Lord, help us to do justice, to make peace, to embody your love in all that we do. We pray all of this and so much more in the mighty name of your son, our Lord. Amen. If we were in church, we would be taking offering about now, and um, just a reminder that you could always send your offering in. Um, like I said, hopefully we'll be back together in worship, uh, maybe next week or um, or one week soon. So um, if uh, I'll send out emails um, as we make that decision, um, and um, um, and you can always call or or text or email me and and ask if uh, if you miss that. So. And now, my friends, as the song says, Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit to this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love. Send us power. Send us grace. Be safe, my friends, and go in peace. Amen.